Yes, hi, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Now, before I start, how many of you know about esports? I'm assuming quite a bit of you in the audience, but can you just raise your hand if you know what esports is? Okay, so you guys can go to sleep for the first 10 minutes. But no, seriously, this is a, a kind of a whirlwind tour of esports. I'm going to be starting from the very bottom about what esports is, you know, the history of esports. And there's actually quite a lot of interesting stuff in there that I didn't know when I was researching it, so I think everybody will get something out of that. But we're just building up and we'll have a lot of stats in the middle as well. And that's what I'm talking about, the billion dollar year. The, the industry is growing at an exponential rate. And there's a lot of stats and figures to back that up. And that's where I'll get to in the middle. And at the end, we'll have some diversity and media stuff as well. So who am I? I am Kiernan, as Hanya said, scoundrel low. I find it really funny in a lecture setting to say scoundrel. But yeah, I'm Kiernan low. I studied medicine at the University of Sheffield. And after my degree, decided I didn't want to be a doctor. I kind of hated it for some reason. Uh, and I found an opportunity to go full-time in esports commentary. Uh, I started working when I was in university for a body of students who do esports across university called the National University Esports League. I'm sure some of you might have heard of that here. They do basically varsity-style esports games between universities across the country. And I started doing freelance, you know, free commentating for them for two years. And then I, sort of after, after university, I had the opportunity to go full-time and I've been doing it since July 2016, which is you know, quite a long time now, so I've been really enjoying it so far. So again, I said, we're going to start really basic. What is eSports? Now, in its most simple form, it's playing a video game competitively. If you go to Wikipedia, the source of all student information, <laughs> you will find that people have said eSports has existed since the 1970s when they were playing Pong and Pac-Man competitively. There was an arcade game show where people played arcade games competitively against each other. But that's not really what we know esports is today. Esports is not quite playing Pong against each other. There's a whole different form of esports that we, we kind of know today. And it's because of the globalization of the internet and, and gaming, it kind of paved the way to this new form of entertainment. And I think my best description of esports is the highest level of competitive, competitive video gameplay packaged, produced, and broadcast like a traditional sport. It is the whole package of what you'd expect watching a football game, but you're playing, seeing people play computer games against each other. And that's kind of where it's developed to now. It started here in South Korea. This is where realistically the esports trend kind of went out. After the 1997 Korean financial crisis, they decided to invest in broadband. They basically said, okay, well, we just need to invest all, all of our infrastructure into broadband. I've turned this off somehow. There we go. No, I haven't. They need to invest everything into the infrastructure and broadband, and it sort of gave rise to these things called PC bangs, which were like these internet cafes full of PCs where people played games. And because of the seriously high unemployment after the Korean financial crisis, loads and loads of people turned to playing video games at a high level as a pastime. And that kind of spread up to natural human competition, people playing video games competitively against each other. But this is a little bit of a video that I want to show you. I'll see if I can pause it. This is a video that I want to show you. Now, some of you that do follow League of Legends, which is probably one of the most popular games in the world, this is an OGN broadcast from 2012. So at the very start of what we call the golden age of esports. And this is kind of showing you the level of production that they put into these events over in South Korea. We didn't get that level of production really over in the West for a little bit longer. But 2012, 2011, Korea was doing these ridiculous sold out arenas for competitive computer games. So I'll just show you the video.
So I don't know many traditional sporting broadcasts that would still get that level of production, let alone esports broadcasts. But that's how serious they took it over in Korea. And that was back in the StarCraft days, they were doing stadiums like that in early 2000s. And this is competitive computer games. So they took it really seriously in South Korea. And that's kind of the, the first country that exported it as a professional type of sport. So as I talked about mass building, I've kind of gone over this already, but it gave right to PC bangs, high unemployment. And 2000, the Korean Esports Association, KESPA, was formed to regulate the industry. So they actually are way ahead of where e we even are in the country now. We have the British Esports Association, which is not even a, a formally recognized government body. In 2000, the Koreans already had a formally recognized government body to regulate the esports industry. That's, you know, I can't even remember playing computer games in, in year 2000, let alone being able to consider esports. So they, they are very, very far ahead in terms of infrastructure. And any of you that follow esports, I know a lot of you do, it's part of the reason, because of this long history of infrastructure and, and government backing, it's part of the reason why Korean esports are so dominant in certain, in certain areas. They just have so much backing from their government bodies that they actually have the, the, the best environment to train in. And also, OGN began broadcasting tournaments on TV before it was easily accessible on, like, on the internet. Believe it or not, Twitch was founded in 2011. People who have been watching Twitch, I know some of you probably do, it's an online broadcasting service where they basically can broadcast anything that you want that's generally gaming focused. 2011 was on that format. I feel like it's been around forever, but OGM was broadcasting it on TV, you know, these kind of events on TV, and they still retain the title sponsorships, they've just integrated themselves into Twitch. So they've got a very, very long history. Now this is a, a timeline that I put together. I, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but the first ever officially esports tournament that was ever called an esports tournament was in 1997 at E3, which a lot of you will probably know as a, as a big gaming convention, and it was a Quake tournament. So Quake was officially the first ever esport titled esport, and Quake is a first-person shooter for anyone that doesn't know. It's a, can't really describe it, like an alien type first-person shooter. And you see that since that, everything started popping up. One thing I really want to point out is Turtle Entertainment in May 2000 was born. Turtle Entertainment is the parent company of ESL. So if anyone knows ESL, does anyone here know ESL? They're called the Electronic Sports League. They are the primary instigator for the rise of esports, especially in the Western Hemisphere. They essentially run, organize, produce esports tournaments, and they started in the year 2000. So that's when they, they began, and it's now 17 years, and they're still under Turtle Entertainment, just been bought out by a, a Swedish or a Norwegian media giant. But that's when they started. That's one of the most important dates in esports history, especially for the Western Hemisphere. And you can see lots of various championships. Some of them are now defunct, like the World Cyber Games that barely happens anymore, but that was one of the really big uh, sort of esports tournaments back in the day. ESL Pro League, which a lot of you, if you follow CSGO, will know, is still going, but it, believe it or not, started in August 2002. So ESL Pro League has been going on for very long. It's actually probably one of the most prestigious tournaments for Counter-Strike Global Offensive that exists right now. And for those of you that don't know what Counter-Strike Global Offensive is, it's a first-person shooter game of terrorists versus counter-terrorists. It's very simple. And so you're getting all the way up to this start of timeline. This is when esports started to be taken almost semi-seriously. We started having first players transferred. So SK Gaming was the first player to ever sign a, a player or transfer a player for a fee. Before that, there was, no, there was no contracts. There was no signing transfers. People just moved teams when they were, when they were done. But SK Gaming, which is a German organization, they were the first player, team to ever transfer a player for a fee. And then one of the most prestigious tournaments we still have now, the Intel Extreme Masters, was born on June 06. So this is the early iteration of esports. This is from 1997 to mid-early 2000s. But it's not quite the golden age. The golden age of esports kind of kicked off around 2010, 2011. And Twitch.tv, which is the biggest form of uh, broadcasting esports, was probably part of the reason for it. So we, we started to see a massive explosion of esports from 2010. From 10 tournaments in 2000 to 260 in 2010, with prize pools you know, totaling over $1 million. If anyone follows Dota 2, you'll know that the International is known as one of the biggest prize pool tournaments in the world. I can't remember what it was this year, but I think it was something like 16 million or something stupid like that. How much was it, sorry? 26, 26 million. See, I don't follow Dota 2, unfortunately, but 26 million for one team to take the lion's share of, which is uh, just a ridiculous amount of money for playing a computer game, if you really think about it. But that's where the industry is going. Um, and like I said, the, on, the growth of online streaming platforms was, a, was one of the main reasons. It, it meant that anybody with an internet connection could access this form of entertainment for free, which is 
kind of part of the reason why you saw a massive explosion in it. Sometimes when you wanted to watch your favorite sporting event on TV, it's pay-per-view, you had to pay for it. Twitch.tv was a completely free service. People who are interested in this type of entertainment, as long as you had an internet connection, you could view it. And it, it, just, it was so accessible that everybody started to take it up. And then we had in 2011 two fairly popular MOBAs, you could say. League of Legends and Dota 2 officially were released in 2011. And they are still retaining them spots as probably two of the top esports in the world. I'd say MOBAs especially. League of Legends is the most popular game in the world. And that was released in 2011. And in part, probably, is credited for one of the major rises of esports. Without League of Legends, I don't know if esports would be where it is right now. So if anyone follows League of Legends and have followed it for years, I wanted to give you an example of what these games can mean to the players involved. And then this is probably the most famous League of Legends clip that has ever been played out in history. So if anyone that knows League of Legends prob probably know what it is, but this is, this is, I want you to, especially if you don't follow League of Legends, I want you to watch the players after the clip. I don't expect you to know what's going on, but I want you to listen to the commentators and watch the players after the clip, because it really hits home that this is a genuinely emotional, moving sport that people can really, really get invested in. You can't really hear the commentators. It's okay, just, just watch the players. Pause it there. So if anyone knows that, uh, does anyone know what that clip was? Just uh, it was X-Pac-A, backdoor the Nexus. Yeah. Yeah, it's called the X-Pac-A it's, uh, <laughs> it's probably the most famous League of Legends clip in, in, in history. It's got a, a funny name, I know, but <laughs> that's what it was called in League of Legends terms. And the guys you saw there, the Fnatic, they won a huge tournament after, off the back of what was just such a ridiculous play. And if you knew League of Legends, you know that, that was, it was... <laughs> It was like scoring a goal in the 97th minute. You know, it was, it was very, very, very sort of high quality play. The guy you saw crying into the scarf, uh, he's called Ocelot and now owns one of the most, uh, sort of, I think one of the biggest brands in, in European gaming that exists right now called G2. But off, he was, used to be a professional League of Legends player, went on to create one of the biggest brands in, in European gaming. So, I mean, all these players have got such ridiculous passion for it. And kind of that clip, I think, really illustrates kind of what it means to win these kind of tournaments. And that was, I think we're back in 2013, so it's even you know, higher stakes now. That was playing for sums of money that these kind of tournaments these days would be considered meager. So this is the, uh, the data part of my, uh, my presentation. I got all of my infographic and infographics and data from a place called Newzoo. They do esports data, they do esports uh, trends, they do esports predictions. Uh, they're really, really good. Um, so I thoroughly recommend going checking them out if you want to, but this is where I got all of my stuff from. They look at primarily professional competitive gaming and channels of revenue in professional competitive gaming. I'm talking sponsorships, media rights, that kind of thing. Anything in amateur, so any prize pools in amateur gaming, that's things like the UK ESL Premiership, anything that's not considered professional competitive gaming, they don't look at. So this is a snapshot of true professional esports. So total 2017 revenue predicted this year, this was done in February, was 696 million worldwide. And this is the breakdown of where that comes from. You see the majority of it comes from sponsorships. That's things like Intel sponsoring the Intel Extreme Masters. That's things like Cooler Master sponsoring a team. You know, extrinsic and intrinsic sponsors sponsoring parts of esports. That's where the majority of the money comes from in esports, as does with traditional sports as well. Funnily enough, when they gave the prediction last year for what it would make this year, that number was 500 million. This year, in February, they changed it to 700 million. If you ask about, if you ask anybody who's keeping track already, this number is 900 million. So this was predicted to be a 25% growth last year. They predicted this year that it's a 41% growth. It's now a 55% growth. 
So esports is exponentially rocketing in terms of the investments and the money involved in it. And then if you look at when they predicted we'd hit over 1 billion, they predicted in 2020 that we'd be hitting over 1 billion global revenue for esports. And that's just the, the, the very core competitive area of esports. I reckon that's going to be next year or the year after. It's going to be a lot sooner than people predict because of the way that these, these trends have been changing. They don't have a huge amount of data to work with, especially because realistically, as you can see, the explosion of esports is ridiculous. It's 2015. We're looking at, you know, the sort of the levels of, of trend you're seeing. So before that, if you looked at the graph before this, it kind of just went like that. It was just a flat line the entire way. And then just suddenly 2014, 2015 took off. Um, no one knows why. I think it, in part due to popularity of games and just people enjoying the free service and just people starting to invest in it because I think it's a good space. But mark my words, when they come up with their next year uh, graphics, they, I wouldn't be surprised if they put 1 billion as the predicted revenue for 2018 for next year. So it's going very, very quickly. This is looking at the average spend per esports fan. So who here has actually bought esports merchandise? I can see Astralis Hadim in the back there, but yeah. <laughs> you know, so very few esports fans actually want to part with money, which is an interesting thing because if you look at basketball, which is it'd be there, fifteen dollars is the average revenue per fan in basketball. That's not to say that every basketball fan spends fifteen dollars. That's to say that if you take the amount of revenue that they gain from fan purchases or, or whatever, and you divide that by the actual viewership, it's fifteen dollars. If you look at esports in twenty seventeen, the current is three point six dollars. So if you take esports viewership worldwide and you look at the revenue that you get from purchases, $3.6 per viewer is the, is the average. We're, we're well below. But what, is, what, are, what are the reasons for that? Yeah. Does that include um, like ticket sales? No, I think it's just purely merchandise for, for brands. But, uh, but I think we'll get to the ticket sales in a minute. But, but ticket sales are very low compared to normal sporting events. So you'll see that you're not... You, Yes, so that's, I will get to that. <laughs> don't you worry. Uh, Newzu does not take in-game purchases as as they don't do any in-game purchases. This is purely esports revenue. So uh, in-game, that's a developer revenue for a game. It's not an esports revenue because gaming and esports are, are supposed to be very separate areas. Newzu takes purely esports revenue. No in-game purchases, no RP, no skins for CS:GO. Nothing like that gets calculated because if it did, I'm sure the the, the revenue would be a lot higher. But that is in part due to how cheap esports merchandise and also ticket sales, if it does, in, it does include it, I'd have to double check, but how cheap everything is compared to tr traditional sporting events. If I, want to go to, if I wanted to go to IEM Katowice, one of the biggest IEM events, packs out a 20,000 stadium, I'd pay $40 to go, maybe max. If I wanted to go to a 20,000 stadium football game, you know, for, I don't know, premiership team, I'm probably paying close to 80 to 90. So it's... it's it's very expensive sometimes to go to a traditional sporting event, and often you'll find that a lot of esports events are well below market value for what they give in return. There is an optimistic line here, which is where they say, is if, if spending increased, if they came out of this year and said that spending was up towards there, they predict it would go up to $11 by 2020. But in general, the, the takeaway that they get from this is that esports fans are very hard to part, part with their money. My takeaway is that actually esports is cheap compared to everything else. Would you like me to go back? No, it's OK. <laughs> so this is the ticket revenue section here. In 2016, there were 424 events. And ticket revenue only made up 32 million of what was about a 500 million revenue across the year. So it's a very small percentage of what esports makes as a global industry. Uh, and you'll find that most events take place in North America, even though um, North America has a, sort of a, a lower percentage weight in, in terms of total events, they're also the most expensive place to buy tickets for, for eSports. You'll find that actually Europe's quite representative of its own share, 26% events and also makes up 29% of the revenue, so Europe's fairly representative. But in general, eSports tickets don't make that much money right now, mainly because you know, you don't have a game every week that you go to a stadium for. You don't, you don't sort of expect to turn up to a stadium to watch your favorite esports players play unless you're going to something like the LCS, which is a weekly broadcast stadium, but that's only to about 100 to 200 people a week. So you don't have regular events for esports where people can turn up and watch. It's the big events. It's like your FA Cups, your, you know, your, um, I don't actually know any other football cups. Sorry, I'm terrible at football. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 very few and far between the esports events, so it makes up a very small percentage of the revenue. When you look at prize money, 
it kind of reflects the trend of esports investment and revenue in general. You see this flat line down here? We didn't start to see massive growth until the early 2000s, the golden years, which is what we're still in. We're still in the golden years. We're still growing, and no one really knows where it's going to stop right now. Prize pool in 2016 for total events worldwide was nearly 100 million. And I'm sure Dota 2 made up a large percentage of that, but you know, it, it was nearly $100 million. And most of that, like you said, came from North American major events. So North America generally is what people have considered the esports egg. You know, that's where everything good happens in esports. If you want to crack the esports market, you crack North America because all the big events happen there, the massive prize pools happen there, the massive amount of viewership happens there. So this is what I said earlier, esports is worth. I'm sorry about the text, by the way. I did have some different text fonts, but I just didn't transfer them, unfortunately. So it looks a bit funny. Like I said, they're predicted 1.5 billion global revenue by 2020, but 2017 has already surpassed their predictions. So it, it's likely going to happen a very, very uh, sort of quick time before that. So who watches esports then? Because audience is obviously important as well. If you see that the audience is, is reflecting the growth, maybe not quite as, as, as heavily as, as the, the sort of the revenue and the sponsorships and so on and so forth, but in 2017, they predicted that 191 million unique users will have viewed esports, and they separate that into occasional viewers and esports enthusiasts. Now, those two definitions are as follows. They classify an esports enthusiast as someone who has watched an esports event or participated in an amateur tournament at least once a month. So anything more than that is considered an esports enthusiast. Occasional viewer is someone who has admitted to watching an esport event in the past three months, but no more than once a month. So that's what they, they sort of uh, classify these two sort of sections as. For someone who watches once a year, maybe, I don't know. I don't know where they classify them. It doesn't look like they have. But this is what they've, they've put, this, put this down to. So lots and lots of, um, what am I talking about? Sorry, so 191 plus 100, 194, I read that wrong. But yeah, so you've got two huge sets of audiences there for esports, and they predict, again, a massive growth uh, and about 20% growth they've been doing each year. But again, we don't know what the statistics are going to be like that when we come next year. It could be just like the revenue. It could be a lot higher. We'll find out when they get their reports at the end of the year. So age and gender. Uh, this is something that is, is really interesting to me because esports is a male-dominated space. And, and I'll get on to that a little bit later. But the majority of esports enthusiasts are people like me, a male between 21 and 35. That is, the, that is the almost 40% of all esports uh, viewership. Females actually make up nearly 30% of all viewership, which is actually, for me, was quite surprising. Um, but that has been growing on year. I don't know why. Is it maybe maybe um, women are now more comfortable admitting they watch esports or they feel more comfortable being involved in the community, but that has been growing year on year. So I'd be interested to see what happens at the end of this year as to sort of where those statistics go. And the occasional viewers, you'll find that actually it's a lot more fe females are occasional viewers. So the esports enthusiasts are dominated by men, but it's a lot more women in the occasional viewership role, which is once every three months. And this is what the sponsors love. This is what the sponsors want to hear. This is your average online population. So everybody globally that's online, 50% are in a full-time job, believe it or not, and high household, high household income are in 37%. Your esports enthusiast, 62% are in a full-time job, and 50% are from a high, high, household, high household income. Which, for sponsors, that's music to their ears. You, you hit a, a full-time job, a high household income, they've got uh, expendable cash, that's what they want to hear. This is, the kind of, this is the kind of statistic that they want to puncture, which is why people are flooding money into the market, because based on all the research, you've got people who are wealthier and, uh, and sort of more actively engaged in, in their own you know, money making or whatever than your average online population. So that's why sponsors are suddenly throwing cash at esports, because all the re research has suggested this is, these people are likely to spend money. So how does the UK compare? This is from a different set of um, research. This is from a Nielsen report, which was done this year, which primarily focuses on audience. It's got way more in-depth audience uh, uh, sort of statistics across four different countries, the USA, France, Germany, and the UK. So this is just going to look at how the UK compares in general esports terms. So there's, a, there's a theory that esports viewers don't like traditional sports. Uh, I, I myself, I love rugby. I've grown, grown up on rugby. So they did the uh, research into sort of looking at if they liked other sports alongside esports. And actually, almost 60% of esports viewers followed soccer or football. And you can see there uh, boxing, motorsport, tennis, and rugby. So there is, there is this fallacy that actually esports 
viewers and esports sort of participants don't like traditional sports. That's just wrong. They do. And you can see that they've got a vested interest in other sports as well. This is the top five PC games followed by the, uh, the cross-platform games. So which in the UK? League of Legends is the second. Counter-Strike is the first in the UK. So Counter-Strike, which is the terrorist versus counter-terrorist, that is the most um, followed eSport in the UK, followed by League of Legends, which is the most popular game in the world. Dota 2, somehow H1Z1, don't know how that got there, and StarCraft. <laughs> H1Z1, if anyone, if anyone is laughing in the audience, it's because H1Z1's a, I don't even know if you call it an eSport these days, but it's like, it's like a fun game. Like you shoot zombies and shoot each other, it's got Battle Royale and yeah. So H1Z1 is, um, is, is kind of up there for UK. Apparently we love really casual games in the UK and you'll, we'll see that as we go further into these slides. Top five cross-platform games, I don't think anyone is, is surprised. Call of Duty, FIFA, Halo, Overwatch, and apparently Street Fighter. So we have quite a decent uh, base of fighting game enthusiasts in the UK. Let's have a look at these stats here. So this is something that I think we have this funny thing about the UK where we're a nation of console gamers. That's kind of what we're, we're kind of compared as across the, UK, the, the Europe. You'll find that in US, US, France, and Germany, almost half and over half of their population play on a computer. That's 39% in the UK. We actually consume most of our games and esports from a console setting, which is this funny, this funny sort of, um, I guess, reputation that we have cross-regionally that we don't care about PC esports. We do, but not as much as our console esports. So we, we make up a large proportion of console-based esports. That's why things like Call of Duty and all those kind of esports that were sort of uh, broadcast by MLG and MLB were really popular in the UK, but we don't quite follow our own League of Legends, our own Counter-Strike scene as much because it's just not as interesting to us, apparently. If you look at our top 10 games, Grand Theft Auto is our top game in the UK, followed by Call of Duty, followed by FIFA, followed by Mario Kart. And you see, I'm going to go all the way down. The first PC game comes at number 10. So the first PC game that people, on, on our top 10 games list, according to this research, I guess you could kind of count Battlefield as a, as a PC game, but I would imagine, given the, the uh, trend of this list, I'm sad that Candy Crush Saga is above Counter-Strike, but apparently uh, even esports enthusiasts like Candy Crush. Uh, but yeah, you can see we're just not as interested in PC games as we are in console games, according to the research. And this is something that I, this is really controversial, but I love it. I love the infographic. This has been in the news quite a lot. Should esports be an Olympic sport? Less than 30% of us think it should, and I'm in that camp. I, don't, I have no idea why I'd want esports to be an Olympic sport. I, I don't know why anyone's pushing for it. I, it's my personal opinion. I'm sure people have got different, differing opinions, but it seems that most of the esports audience agree with me. I, I, think, I think you'd probably take that 70% and say, one of the answers probably is, I don't care. And that's probably where I am. Like, it's, 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 I have no desire to push esports to be an Olympic sport. I, I think it's, it's completely different to what I think the Olympics should represent. And I think we don't need to be an Olympic sport to be validated. 41% think esports should be a university and college sport. Well, I'm sure the Noor will love to see that. But you know, there's a decent proportion of people that love seeing esports as, a, as a, a competitive university sport. And I thoroughly enjoyed it when I was in university, and I know a lot of people who are part of the societies do. 53% consider esports to be an actual sport, and that's actually a very telling statistic because it is about split down the middle. Do you want esports to be considered an actual sport? Like, raise your hands if you think esports should be considered an actual sport, as in a traditional sport. And I think out of our esports enthusiasts, that's probably about 50-50. It's, it's a, a very tense subject because what does the word sport mean? It's, it's difficult to understand that. Sport, if you've got classified as a sport, you open yourselves up to government funding, you open yourselves up to uh, more legitimacy when it comes to creating events and so on and so forth. But, but should it be a sport? Because this is, this is a very, very tense subject in the community right now. I'm on the fence about it. I don't really know. I'm, I'm not really bothered one way or the other. And 71% think esports will become a mainstream activity in the future which I think is probably very telling of the statistics that we've seen. It's, go, it's growing and growing in popularity, and I fully agree. I think in five years' time, esports will be a very, very popular thing across a multitude of demographics. So, pro players, and I'm sure any of you from League of Legends know who this is. Probably the most famous League of Legends player in the world. He's from South Korea. He's called Faker, and also probably one of the most decorated and well-paid esports pros in the world as well. So where do they make their money from? If you're, a, if you're a professional esports player, where do you make your money? Because you're playing games, how, how do you make your money? Oh, they get a percentage of uh, earnings on all of their skins if they win a world. They do. 
and that will come from in-game stuff as well. They get tournament winnings, they get a salary, they get sponsorships, they get streaming and YouTube revenue and also in-game revenue as well that the teams will dole out to them. So they make a, make a decent amount of money from all of these sources. Believe it or not, high-level professional players can easily earn over a million a year. The average salary in August 2017 of a North American professional player was $105,000. That is just the salary. Not the tournament winnings, not the sponsorships, and not the streaming and YouTube revenue. These probably make up the proportion of their, the major proportion of their income on a yearly basis. Salary is just there for a salary to retain you as, a, as part of a team. Most of these guys are brands in their own right, and they use that brand to you know, get sponsorships and, like I said, build streaming and YouTube revenue. Marks, if anyone knows who this is. Go. It's what? It's not, no. It's Sven, there you go. Yeah, this is Sven. This is a European League of Legends player. He did, yes. So tournament winnings can he uh, differentiate heavily between games. I pulled this statistic um, from a, a, uh, a website called esportsearnings.com. As you'll see, I talked about Dota 2. Dota 2 is a, a game produced by Valve. They have had, over the course of their tournaments, $130 million in prize pools. Uh, they have a flagship event called the International, which has a crowdfunded prize pool where people can buy in-game items to contribute to the prize pool, and it regularly, like we said, hits over 20 million. It was the highest you know, ever. League of Legends comes down as second at 48 million, but that's like a third almost of Dota 2, so Dota 2 is way up in the lead, and CSGO, very close to League of Legends. But you can see there's a lot of money to play for, and these are, these are like I said, only a portion of a player's income. You know, people can make very healthy careers as, as a professional player, but it's also a very risky career because it, it traditionally doesn't last more than five years. The average pro player uh, lifespan in terms of their career is 4.5 years. So you need to make all your money with a plan out the, out, out the other side of it in 4.5 years. And a lot of player, pro players don't. So you see success stories and you see a lot of failures in esports as well. But the industry is getting more and more welcoming and more and more um, forgiving to those players that probably border on the level of mediocrity. So more players are, are kind of being middle of the pack players, but because of the way that esports is going with franchising, with investments, more of them are making a healthy career enough so that they can do something afterwards and, and build a life with it. So diversity. So this is a really big topic in esports right now because we've had lots of controversy. Uh, a chap won an esports industry award called Thorin. If anyone knows who Thorin is, he is a very delightful human being. Um, but he's he kind of triggered a big sort of topics over and over again about diversity in esports. Now, like I said with the statistics, more and more women are starting to be involved in esports, but in what capacity? Because we don't currently have any professional female players. In StarCraft 2, we did. We had quite a few f female professional players, um, but we don't really have any female professional players that play at the highest level of things like CSGO and League of Legends. But what about Team Sorry? Teams. <laughs> Team, if, if anyone was wondering, Team Siren was more of a, uh, a branding strategy to try and bring uh, revenue towards a, a, a company because they, they branded a female team. It was a bit of a joke at the time because it was obviously a marketing ploy. Team Siren was a marketing ploy uh, and it didn't really work out very well, kind of backfired, but because people thought they were just taking the mick basically and they kind of were in a way. And that was one of the, but the Team Siren is one of the, the very important topics that, that we often refer to when talking about diversity. That was five, five females who, who comparatively, in terms of their individu individual skill, were not at a pro level player level, but there are reasons for that. It's not just because they're female. There is no biological reason stopping a, a, a woman playing in, in, a, in, a, in a tournament. There, is, there are no rules against it. Any woman can go into a, a team and, and perform at that level, but there are a lot of reasons why that is harder for a woman to do than it is for a man. So we have female only tournaments starting point, but that's I, you know, a lot of people say, and myself included, that should only be a starting point. Female-only tournaments should be a stepping stone to allow women to feel comfortable in the esports space so then we can develop it so they eventually have mixed tournaments. Because esports tournaments realistically and, and you know, hopefully will be mixed in the future where we have mixed female-male teams, we have full female teams competing against full male teams. That is the, the future that everyone is hoping for. But it's getting there is important. And like I said, they are, there are nuances involved with women joining esports teams. This is one of the, the big ones. A lot of people know that most gaming teams have a gaming house, which is where you go and live and you play games all day, and that's kind of how you train. A lot of pro male pro players who have experienced this have expressed it difficult to find 
integration, especially at that age when you, like a lot of these players haven't been to university yet. They haven't experienced mixed dorms. They haven't experienced living with, with girls at all. So you, you get put into a situation where you're 17 years old and you've never, you've never lived with a girl and they find, they find it difficult and they find it very hard to integrate and therefore often you don't get quite get that gel in the team because it's very difficult at that age, especially if the woman is older or around the same age, they, just can't, they, they either find it difficult to, to, to communicate with them or become friends with them just because they haven't had that life experience yet. And even if they have like, had that life experience because of, of course, esports being a male dominated space and you spend all of your time talking to males, when uh, a woman enters, often relationships can get blurry. Often they might you know, find it difficult to, to, to play with them because they either they've fallen out or they have feelings for them. That's, this is just pro player stories about it. So it's one of the nuances that is difficult. So it needs to be a, a goal for the future is finding a way to properly integrate women into gaming houses because there's no way they can train to be at the level that the men are if they don't have these resources available to them. And this is one of those resource barriers that we talk about for women in esports. It's very difficult to get into these, these scenarios where you can train at the same level as a man because the, unfortunately the men make it hostile maybe through the fault of their own, maybe not through fault of their own, but that's just how it is. Again, because of the lack of ability to go into these gaming houses, they don't find enough time to train and compete. Often they have full-time jobs or full-time study and they just don't have the ability to train at the necessary level to be able to compete at the, the level that the rest of the, you know, the guys are. So it's, it's, again, this is all coming into this resource barrier that, that women have getting into esports. And like I said, they often don't have the same access to things like coaches. They don't have the same access to things like uh, contacts. And if any of you do play at a high level in games, you'll know that especially with the internet, it can be a very toxic environment, not only for, for females, but for men as well. But pre predominantly, if you are a female playing at the top level in a game and what we call um, solo queue or just playing by yourself at your computer, you have voice chat or you have text chat, it can be a very toxic environment for a female to play in. They, 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 they receive a lot of abuse just for being a girl. If, and if they mess up, it's because they're a girl. And often that knocks their confidence and, and a lot of women don't want to be in that kind of environment. It's not just a, um, an issue Know, confined to esports, a lot of you will know that there's a lot of controversy around Twitter on, on, on the internet, that it, the internet in general is still a hostile space to be a woman. And, and that's not exclusive to esports, but we're not really doing enough to, to rectify that. We want to be a space, you know, we have no issues with racism, we have no issues with you know, any other sort of diversity topics, age, you know, racism, all of that, there's no, there's no real issues in esports, but there is still a massive sexism issue in esports. So we're not doing enough to, to sort of rectify that. We are starting to take steps in the right direction. If any of you watched Worlds, you'll know that we have two very predominant female broadcasters. We have Shox and we have Froskirin. Um, Froskirin is an example of how sexism can negatively affect your space. A lot of people were very horrible to Froskirin because she was a woman. And people, won't, people won't say it's because she's a woman, but a lot of it was because she was a woman. Uh, and she, she got through it, and she's now one of the most well-respected broadcasters in League of Legends, especially for the Chinese area of the, the, the world. She has a very lot of sort of in-depth knowledge about Chinese gameplay. But like I said, work still needs to be done. There's still a lot of work that we can do in esports to, to help integrate uh, women into our community. And, and it's going in the right direction, but some will ask questions whether it's quick enough or if we're doing enough. So esports, this is my favorite part, esports in the traditional media, because they hate us. So this, I think this is a, a, a nice way of saying it. This is the mixed reception of esports and traditional media. Um, you get a lot of negative to topics covered. You get promoting an unhealthy lifestyle, you know, sexism, addiction, uh, controversy over potential, you know, there's, there's countless topics that the, the, the traditional media like to comment on. Um, this one that I always get asked, I do a lot of traditional media events. I went to a Telegraph event uh, about three months ago and I had, a, I had a little interim break where I was kind of the little desk where people could come and ask me about esports. Eight out of the 10 people that came to talk to me asked me whether I was making their children fat. You know, so that was, you know, I, they said, how do, how do you feel about your industry making children fat? And, and it is, it, this is hilarious because esports doesn't make children fat. Esports is an activity that you can enjoy when you're growing up in regulated amounts. If you want to, li you know, let your children play esports all day and not encourage exercise, that's not esports, that's by parenting. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, this is a, the, I always get asked this, but esports should be enjoyed as part of a balanced lifestyle. I played rugby for seven years. I go to the gym twice a week. I still enjoy and have a full-time esports career. It is perfectly possible to balance esports and a healthy lifestyle. It's just, you know, it's, it, I, 
are you saying, you know, would you have done exercise anyway if you were just not doing exercise with esports? You know, you've got to you've got to balance that. And is playing nine to five scrims any different from sitting in an office job at your computer from nine to five? You can very easily balance an esports lifestyle with a healthy lifestyle. We talked a lot about the sexism. There's been a lot of um, this is more to do with gaming in general, but there's been a lot of, of talk in the media about gaming addiction, people being unable to put down games. A lot of this came out when, if anyone knew or played World of Warcraft growing up, I did a hell of a lot. Um, it's basically a game that was a, a sort of an online fantasy world. A lot of news topics came out over those years about people being addicted to this game, couldn't put it down, spent 25 hours playing straight, ended up you know, going to hospital. And, and clinics have opened up for gaming addiction, so there's a lot of negative press about addiction. And like I said, controversy about potential Olympic conclusion, like people are saying it shouldn't be an Olympic sport. Well, actually, for once, I kind of agree. And obviously, like I said, sport versus not a sport. But we get some positive press as well. We get the success of the events, career opportunities for people who didn't know exactly where their passions lied, player success stories, and obviously, like I said, growth of the industry. People are always commenting on how much the industry is worth and how much people are investing in it. So it's uh, obviously traditional media likes to see success sometimes, and that's the case here. So as we're getting towards the end, there are a lot of good esports in the UK as well. The uh, pr primary esports is driven by a company called ESL UK. They're based in Leicester, and they are one of the, uh, the franchise parts of the ESL, like I said, founded in 2000. Uh, and they, again, they organize popular and run-running tournaments called the ESL Premiership, which spans several games and includes you know, players from all over the UK and Ireland. So it's how I actually founded my casting career. When I started getting paid, these were the guys that first paid me. I uh, started doing regular studio broadcasts with them. And they've been growing UK esports in general, but they, they find it difficult because, again, the UK is predominantly console-based. So we'll find that you'll get a, a lot more viewership in the UK for professional FIFA than you would for professional League of Legends. But it has been growing steadily, and I think they are hoping in the future that it will continue to do so. And finally, the NUL, which some of you may or may not know, but it's called the National University Esports League. And this was set up by a guy called Josh, who is an incredible person. He's done practically everything from the ground up for free, has never really, until recently, ever made a, a single penny on this, this endeavor. But it's how I started my casting career. It's how I got into casting. Um, and they let me cast their weekly league, and I did it, and I loved it. And it's kind of how I honed my craft. They have access to 125 universities across the UK. They have over 4,500 players with 550 teams. 70 society representatives organizing at each university. So the, some, some representatives at the university will organize their teams for them. And the, I think 125, I think there's 165 universities in the UK. So they actually touch a large percentage of the universities you know, across the UK. And it's also for all skill levels. So anybody, they, they encourage anybody to get involved. Even if you're the worst at the game or the best at the game, they try and get you involved in some way, shape, or form in their tournament format. And then they've just recently started sending people to international tournaments. So people have found an inroad to esports through university, which has been, I think, really successful for them. And they attempt to allow these players to step up to things like the ESL Premiership and then therefore try and find an esports career from that. So it's a really good inroad to esports for university students. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope. I need some that, water. Yeah, have water. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. I don't know how you felt. Obviously, some of you were really engaged with these sports already, but for me, who didn't know as much about it, I just thought absolutely. Fa I mean, I had no idea of some things you were mentioning in terms of the acronyms, but the. Stuff that really interests me, don't laugh, but the gender stuff, my students here know what I'm like. Um, absolutely incredible. I'd like you guys, we have time for about 20 minutes or so, and half an hour questions. And um, whilst you're thinking of one, can I just start and jump in? What could you explain a little bit more about your actual job? Like, what oh, does yeah, that <laughs> kind of week look like for you? Um, so, my job is I'm a freelancer, not everybody's a freelancer, uh, but I generally do events not that regularly so I'll probably do one a week sometimes I'll fly out so for this year I've probably visited 12 countries I've done broadcasts in 12 countries across the world I mainly do it for uh, believe it or not mobile gaming which is a, a growing area of the esports industry uh, and they kind of allowed me to go full-time with it because I get a full-time contract with those guys but generally my week involves uh, I create content I create YouTube content for this game that I, I commentate for uh, I'll travel to Leicester sometimes to go to the studios uh, I'll go, I just recently, I flew to South Africa on holiday, came back from South Africa. Next day, flew to Paris to go and do this NVIDIA. I did an event for NVIDIA, which is a graphics card company. 
Uh, and then I got back and then the week after that, I flew out to uh, Switzerland to do an event. This Saturday, I'm going to Switzerland to do a League of Legends event. And then Sunday, I'm flying to Singapore for <laughs> an event over in Singapore. So I, it, what you'll find with my, my job is that you'll have months where you do nothing and you'll have months where you do everything, uh, as is with freelance, I think, in any kind of industry. But um, what I generally do is I, I dress up something similar to this, maybe. <laughs> I go on the front of a camera and I talk about a game. And commentary is really interesting. Um, the, it's, it, we mimic traditional sports commentary. So we have two roles. We have a play-by-play -play and a color. I am a color caster. I'm an analyst. I do analyzing work for the games that I work in. But the play-by-play -play is the guy who kind of like shouts all the action. He says, oh, this is happening. This is happening. Oh, my God, it's so crazy. And you have the color caster who goes, oh, this happened because of this. Well, that's pretty much what happens in tr traditional sports as well. If you imagine a football game, you have the chap who goes, oh, one, two on the outside of the box. Oh, he scores a goal. And then you've got Ray Wilkins who comes in and goes, oh, it's a nice one, two on the outside. That's kind of, we, 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 mimic, we mimic that exactly in esports. We have the very same traditional broadcasting setup. Um, but what you'll find is compared to traditional broadcasters, we work for long hours. So for instance, I, did, I hosted IEM Katowice this year, which was one of the big League of Legends events. Uh, and on the desk, I was working from 9 a.m. till 10 p.m. So it's a long broadcast day, consistently on camera, consistently with makeup on, in pretty heavy you know, get up with your suits and, and so on and so forth. If I was a traditional sports broadcaster, I'd do a game of football and I'd be off. So there are just a lot longer working days for esports broadcasters compared to traditional broadcasters. several examples of organisations not paying player salaries. A recent example being organisation denial not paying their CSGO team after a full season of play. Do you think it is time for player unions and tribunals to be established to protect players, especially younger and lower tier players, from these problems? This has been uh, a topic that's been prevalent in the UK as well. A lot of people who join lower tier organisations, they will have contracts who you know, say, say they get paid, but to be honest, the contracts that are provided are basically toilet paper. You could, you could literally do anything you wanted with them and you'd never get taken to court. So that's why organizations often abuse it. And I, I, this has been a topic in League of Legends specifically. It's been brought up in North America quite often. Uh, people have been pushing for player unions for a very long time. I think, yeah, I think it is time for player unions. There are a lot of players that do unfairly get essentially ripped off out of money because the organization either has run out of funding, they didn't get their sponsorship, so they can't afford to pay them. So the, the, what they do is they just drop them and say, well, you broke conduct in some way, so you're off. We don't have to pay you. Um, so there's a lot of, unfortunately, we're not advanced enough as an industry yet to have the same kind of protections as, as normal industries would. Uh, and it's, it's disheartening sometimes to see some players get really put behind in terms of their own personal life as well, because you know, these guys live on that money. And if you take it away from them, they have nothing to live. So not all, not all of them have support networks and not all of them have support nets. So yeah, fully endorse, I, I would be fully endorsing uh, any kind of player unions that would exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how would we go about as a university getting more teams set up and getting sent to the NUEL to get this sort of on the map with sports? So most universities have a gaming society. I don't know if you guys have a gaming society. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, what the, the NUEL does, I haven't been involved with the NUEL for a little while, but from when I was there, what you did is you just you reached out to the NUEL Facebook page and, and someone would pick you up. And, and it's very easy to then get in communication with one of the higher levels of the NUEL. Like Josh often responds directly. It's very easy to just reach out to them on their Facebook page and say, we're interested in sending players to League of Legends or, or whatever other games they cover now, I don't know, or more CSGO games or whatever. And they can help you organize it. The best thing you can do is, I know they're super active on Facebook, so I would go and make a Facebook post say, I'm representing the University of Lincoln Esports Society and I'd really like to send more teams. How can I go about doing this? How do I register them? How do I get them involved? So Facebook is the best place to reach them, and I think it has been for the last few years. So. How do you think uh, the, um, the recent Battlefall Conference controversy has affected um, esports as a medium? <laughs> the Battlefront controversy. Uh, so if anyone doesn't know the Battlefront controversy, what Electronic Arts, our favorite game publisher of all time, did <laughs> is they took a very special game. People love Star Wars, right? And people have loved Star Wars for a very long time. Battlefront is a Star Wars game that's like a, a first-person shootery or third-person shootery type game of Star Wars. I haven't, I haven't bought it, so I've never, I, you know, I haven't played it for about 10 years. I've played the old ones, but um, what EA did is they, they put this game together. They packaged and sold it for 40 pounds. So a full price game, you'd expect, was it not 40 pounds? It was 
Oh, eighty dollars, even more than that. So you know, you're looking like towards sixty pounds. Then it was a, it was more than a full price game. This is a game that you would expect to get hours of content out of. And when they got into the game, they found they had to pay more for in-game microtransactions to unlock their favorite characters. If you wanted to play as Darth Vader, ten dollars, and you might not even get a chance to get him. It's all through in-game loot gambling. The funny thing is that this problem can be rooted back to Blizzard Entertainment. Blizzard Entertainment released Overwatch as a full price game. It was forty pounds. But in Overwatch, they released also in-game microtransactions. Now, in-game microtransactions are where you spend a little bit of money in game to have a chance to achieve some sort of content that you want. Free games do this all the time because it's how they make money. League of Legends is a completely free game, but they have in-game microtransactions. That is a accepted model. People enjoy that kind of play because if they don't want to spend money, they can grind things themselves. If they do want to spend money, they can get their skins or whatever they want from it. So it's fine for a free to play game to have microtransactions because how are you going to make money otherwise? Full price games though, that trend was started by Blizzard. Blizzard Entertainment released Overwatch as a £40 or £35 game and then they introduced also loot crates, which where you could spend money and you could you have a chance to get a skin. So they yeah, cos they're cosmetic items, so you, but you don't need them, right? You don't need cosmetic items, but, I mean, but, but this is the, I, I will get there, don't worry. So they, they introduce the cosmetic items, but people love cosmetic items, right? They, they, they love to make their favorite hero look slightly different to give them an individual player. But what, what they did make normal, in terms of the broader sense, is they made a full price game, it's normal to have in-game microtransactions. Doesn't matter what they're for, but they made it normal for people to have in-game microtransactions because no one said anything about Blizzard's in-game microtransactions because they were just cosmetic. They didn't mean anything. EA took this a bit further. They, they put in-game microtransactions, but they did mean something. You could get different characters or you could get different uh, weapons and so on and so forth. So the, Blizzard has made it a norm and EA just took it a little bit too far, but the, the backlash was ridiculous. I mean, I've never seen a community backlash online on Reddit, on Twitter. Every, everybody literally made effigies of EA and burnt them at their home. That's essentially what it was like. Um, and they lost $3 billion in stock because of it. Um, and that's the only reason they lost $3 billion of stock, though, believe it or not, is because their investors said, oh, well, you're not going to make any money from in-game microtransactions because you've got rid of them. So. As soon as they bring it back, the investors will put it back in. That's the, the, no, no one cared about the community outcry. Only EA cared, and the investors didn't care. The investors only want the money. So, you know, they, they lost a lot of money for that stunt. Um, I, don't know, I don't know whether they plan to bring it back in the future when it's, when it's dropped down a little bit, but we'll see. It was, uh, I've actually forgotten the original question. <laughs> I've gone, gone on such a rant. What was the original question about? What is the impact on esports as a result? Uh, so esports has always had a microtransaction because because League I think you could say League of Legends and Counter Strike uh, can be credited for the growth of esports in the early 2000s to late 2000s. They always had microtransactions in there, and they started to introduce as well as Dota 2 introduce microtransactions that benefited esports teams. I think from a free to play setting like Dota 2 and and League of Legends and CS:GO is not free to play, but it's pretty cheap, and you don't actually need the skins, and it's a whole different industry in its own right, so we won't go there. Um, but these free-to-play games that offer microtransactions that support the esports teams is a perfectly healthy way to help support your esports favorite players or your favorite teams, and help build, and they can help build their brands. I think that's a perfectly healthy way because again, you don't need to buy them. You only buy them if you want to. It doesn't have any impact on your game or your play or your skill level or anything like that. Um, so, I don't think the EA thing is going to impact it unless we start having games that are full price paid. You know, for instance, Overwatch. If they started then introducing paid esports tokens like for all their, their franchise scheme that they've got going on, then maybe you'll see some sort of backlash there because you're already paying for Overwatch as a game. But I think until we see that, we won't really know. Yeah. Um, as a caster, how do you feel about the, I guess, attempts to commentate on games such as uh, Unknown's Battlegrounds in terms of scale? Is that science? Oh, God. I have, I have commentated on Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. I did it on NVIDIA. So, for anyone that's not aware of what this gentleman is talking about, most games have a fairly finite area that you concentrate on when you're doing commentary. It doesn't have as much action going on, and if it does, it's quite comprehensible on the screen that you're looking at. There are games now that are being introduced where you have 120 players, often individuals, playing a game, and you have to commentate on it. The problem is that I think until they find a good way to spectate that, there's going to be no good way to commentate that. I personally think you can make it entertaining. But I think you have to focus less on the action and less the cameras on the action and more about the stories behind the players. I've always felt that it's very important to build storylines for players and storylines for teams, especially when there's nothing interesting going on in the game. And with PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, very 
infrequently will you see lots of interesting things going on into the game until you've been 15 minutes in. Uh, and you can't focus on all the action going on around the map. And if you pick a piece of rubbish action, it's going to be rubbish broadcasting. So until they find a good way to spectate that, especially the early, early stages, I would, I'm more in favor of talking about player storylines, what it means to the players, how they got here, all that kind of thing. Um, but we haven't found a successful remedy for oh, a successful formula for it yet, I don't think. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think, uh, like I said, we had a lot of press about addiction. And it, I think it's, it's difficult to, to sort of, because obviously t these games put like tips in, like go outside or stop playing after two hours and, and remember to care about your family. Um, <laughs> but genuinely, that, that is a tip that I've seen in the game. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to say how much responsibility should the developers have. I personally think that they should have more responsibility, but what, what do you do? Do you limit how much someone can play per day? They won't want that. That's bad for their business model. It's, it's, it, you know, that level of responsibility would kill their, potentially kill their business. So it's difficult to know how much responsibility the game developers them sh themselves should have, um, but whether there was more of like a personality push, you know, a lot of ways that ideas are pushed in the esports industries are through personalities like YouTubers, like Twitch personalities or, or content creators. So. You know, unless there was like a, a campaign, a charity campaign set up to try and promote healthier lifestyles, you know, it, it's, it's probably the best thing you're going to get because de developers will never limit how much you can play their game. Um, it, it's very difficult to do so, even if they wanted to, and, and they probably would never do that because it would be bad, like I said, for their business and also for, you know, their playtime and all those kind of metrics. Um, but whether a charity should exist to try and promote healthier lifestyles, I know that there's a big push for mental health in gaming right now. People are, there's, a, there's a high percentage of people who play games who suffer with mental health conditions. Uh, I, having trained as a doctor, especially interested in that, I did some research um, about two years ago, never got around to finishing it, but you know, I still have the results. But I found there was a very high percentage of, of people in the gaming industry, well above the norm of, of general population that suffer with mental health conditions. And so there's a massive charity push to help gamers be more aware of their own mental health conditions and seek help and, and so on and so forth. Um, so maybe the same should exist there for, for balancing your lifestyle with, you know, like you said, physical activity and, and eating healthily and so on and so forth. So, because they had the mental health issue anyway, and they actually found yeah. space within the game. So I did a qualitative survey where I had a bit of quantitative, quantitative data and a little bit of qualitative data. And, and people who filled in the, the qualitative data said that, yes, some of them said that you know, it was just coincidental. Some of them said that they actually found the online space as a way to escape from problems that they had in real life. They felt that their friends on the online space were more caring than their friends that they had in real life. So you find, I think they found a lot of a large percentage of, well not a large percentage, but a percentage of people that suffer with mental health conditions often use the online gaming space as a way to escape maybe the reality that they find really difficult to deal with. So yeah, there was a large percentage of the people who actually filled in the survey and suffered a mental health condition, they did find that. So yeah, it's something that I'm really interested in because you know, I, I, I was, before I was going to do this, I, was, I was wanted to be a, you know, a, in, go into psychiatry. So it's part of an area of medicine that I loved. And so it's something that I was really passionate about. So uh, yeah, but I did find that you, you know, there is now a big push to try and help people in gaming with mental health conditions. And I'm, I'm really happy to see that. Yeah. So I wanted to ask a question about uh, investors and owners of companies and stuff like that. Okay. Do you think it is worrying that big investors are starting to hold significant shares in multiple esports teams? An example of this would be ES Force having significant shares in SK Gaming and Narvi and completely owning Virtus Pro, so the three really big mm -hmm. esports teams. They also own two esports betting sites, so Dota 2 Lounge and there's another one that I can't remember the name of. My question is do, do we need a regulatory body to stop conflicts of interest like this happening? It depends. What you mean by conflicts of interest? Because, because if you're trying to say that because they have stakes in all these individual, you know, these individual teams, they could influence match outcomes, then you know that's that's the regulatory body does exist in esports to prevent match betting. It's something that came out of Korea. Um, Korea actually in 2007 had a massive match fixing scandal. Um, StarCraft players were throwing games against each other because of betting on their each individual games. So we we had that set up from Korea and exported to the West. We actually have an, a regulatory body for things like match fixing. I'd have, to, I'd have to look it up, but I, I did do some research on it. If you want to get me an email, I can send you details about it. But the Koreans have a body that they've exported uh, for match fixing. But also, you'll find in, in a lot of countries like Germany and France, esports is actually classified as a sport and come under the sport regulatory bodies. Um, so any country like Sweden, like Denmark, uh, where esports is classified by the government as a sport, you get the regulatory bodies that come with that.
So every regulatory body that covers a sport also covers an e-sport in those countries. In the UK, that doesn't exist because we're not a sport. So. Yeah. Do you think that will make it move towards it being accepted as a normal sport more often? Yeah, it's really interesting because I did some consultation for Manchester City last year when they were trying to buy esports players. They would not go anywhere near like League of Legends and Counter Strike. They wanted to buy a FIFA player. And my advice to them was like, why are you buying a FIFA player? Most people who play FIFA probably also are interested in, sp in, in football in some way, shape, or form. You're not going to, exp you're not going to expand your audience base by buy playing, buying a FIFA player. I don't think an Arsenal fan is going to see that you've bought a FIFA player and say, ah, oh, nice, I'm going to support Manchester City now. But, you know, so, but I, I think the, the likes of Schalke and PSG, they have done the right thing. They've bought League of Legends teams. They've bought something that is completely separate to football to expand their audience base. I think it's half and half of becoming accepted. I think. A lot of these, sport, these, these teams are doing it as purely a brand move. They want to increase their brand awareness in different audiences, especially given the quality of the esports audience according to the research. So a lot of them are trying to basically, um, for instance, um, for instance, Schalke picking up a League of Legends team, they want to try and move some of their merchandising to Asia. So they, they are specifically are trying to sell t-shirts and, and, and merchandising in Asia because of trying to move into the esports space. But I think in general, Yes, it has had some impact. Obviously, you get a lot of negative feedback from people who like traditional sports fans, like, oh, why is my team buying an esports team? What's this fake sport about? But yeah, I think in general, the more and more teams that become involved in it, the more normal it will become and the more exposure it gives esports as general. So yeah, I think it's, it's only a good thing. It's not a bad thing to have money coming into the industry that way. And, and if anything, I, I, I fully support traditional sporting teams trying to get involved. In League of Legends, who has been your favorite caster to work with and why? Uh, if any of you guys know Medic, does anyone know, watch the EU LCS? Network? Yeah, Medic is how the guy I started my uh, career with. He's now going to work full time for the EU LCS. So he's moving to Germany on the 1st of January. So I'm really, really happy for him because he's kind of achieved his full time. He was also a doctor, believe it or not, uh, but hence the name Medic. Um, and he quit you know, at the same time that I quit and he's gone full time and he's found his position at Riot Games. So I'm really happy for him. So um, in terms of an emotional standpoint, like Medic will always be my favorite cast to, to have ever worked with. Um, I think. The person I most enjoyed working with in general was a guy called Crumbs. Uh, I did IEM Katavisa with him. He's just, he's just a big personality. He's just really, really funny to, to work with, and he's kind of uh, got a very dry wit, which I really appreciate. So Crumbs is probably just my favorite person to work with, but, but from an emotional standpoint, it'll always be Medic. Oh, I'll, I'll go here. Um, what sort of advice would you give to someone looking to get established in the esports scene, not as a player, but in sort of a so what I'd say is, is that the best thing you can do is just continuously try to reach out to people that in, within the industry. The, the way that I got most of my work was just by trying to make friends with people in the industry so I could get recommendations. Um, often you'll find if you talk to someone, they could say, well, you talk to this guy, he might have something for you. For instance, for production, uh, I would tell you to go email a guy called James Dean who owns ESL UK, and they'll be look they're always looking for extra production guys to bring on, I even as just apprenticeships, but even you know, sometimes as full-time positions. Uh, for teams, it's a little bit harder. Uh, often you have to wait for them to offer a roll up they just, because they, they're, a lot of them are small companies right now. They don't just throw roles around like that. They, they, you know, they'll, they'll be looking for roles, but you've got to have something that you, you would think would be beneficial for the team like you know teams now are expanding to include things like personal trainers cooks managers um, video production staff all that kind of stuff so you know down the line they'll start just checking their websites they often advertise positions and I've seen people who've had no esports exp experience a guy who's now the splice European strategic director for the team splice I, I don't remember him ever doing anything in esports and now he's he's basically do, running one of the biggest European teams you know European strategic director, so yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, for the most part, uh, often it's just best to try and connect and talk with people in the esports industry. Um, message them, or tweet at them, email them, just say, look, I'm really interested in this. Do you know anybody that would have anything you know, for me? Or do you know anybody that, can you give me advice who I should reach out to? And often it's just finding those contacts. I think it's with any industry really, contacts are, are the, the number one way and, and it's no different in, in esports. Mm -hmm. um, but 
that was not the case six or seven years ago, especially in um, one of my favourite games, Counter Strike Source. Yep. 1.6, yep. you know, very big teams um, from the UK, uh, like Mouse Sports and stuff like that. Um, so my question is that it seems like the UK did not follow Europe, North America, and Asia into the golden age of esports. Um, so do you think the UK is lagging behind? Yeah. I mean, the simple answer to the question is yes, but you saw it in the statistics that we had that we are primarily console gamers in the UK. We actually were in a really interesting space during CS 1.6 and CS Source where we had a very high caliber of players, but that's because it was, it was the dominant FPS on computers. So if you played FPS back then, the only competitive FPS that wasn't Quake was Counter-Strike, realistically. So if you're interested in, in a first-person shooter game, most people on PC would play Counter-Strike. Now you've got first-person shooters that the dominant, you know, the whole breadth of the market. You've got Overwatch, which is like a hero first-person shooter. You've got Counter-Strike. There's so many different games now compared to back then in terms of online competitive games. There was just less online competitive games to choose from in the early 2000s. So therefore, we, we were just people who were interested in, in PC gaming were a little bit more focused. So we probably we probably pulled talent from different areas, and we just had a pool of talent that was just good, 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 good PC gamers were all playing Counter-Strike you know, 1.6 and Source. Now you've got things like League of Legends, Dota 2, whole breadth of genres that probably have diluted that talent. And now we've got some good players, because we've got people like Max Law in the EU LCS, we've got um, more UK players, Alfari, Welsh guy, you know, we've got a lot of good top tier players, but they just aren't able to get onto one team. So yeah, I mean, we are seeing a slight increase. The Newell has been really good for picking out talent. Um, I know that a lot of Newell players have, have made rises to UK professional level teams. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely, since the, since the pool of PC gaming opened up from 2010, we still have a big console base in the UK. So the talent that we did have focused before that have kind of been diluted a little bit. Um, but I, I think we'll catch up eventually. I think that's more of a cultural issue than I think an esports issue. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to comment. I think I think what you'll find is regionally in the UK you have a lot more divide than maybe in some other countries. I think in regionally you know we have north and south. Some people don't get on in that so we just have big regional divides in the UK sometimes. Um, often you'll find that. And I've, I found this from going to other countries, and especially you can find it when viewing other esports nationally. Spain national esports is massive. Like they get huge viewership, but it's because everybody that is Spanish supports their Spanish teams. Everybody that's French supports their French teams. We don't quite have that same level of, of patriotism for UK esports. Well, yeah, we don't have any team support. But also just for our UK esports, like we, we don't get the same level of viewership than, than Germany, France, or Spain do. Just, you know, even despite having moderately similar populations, we just don't have as many people interested. So the level of patriotism supporting our national bodies of esports just isn't there compared to other, other countries. Pretty. Oh, one, last, yeah, one more. Last question. Um, where do you see fighting games in the uh, position of I, 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 fighting games are one of my favorite games to view that I don't personally follow myself because they're quite easy to understand, I think, on a very basic level. Uh, Gfinity currently runs Street Fighter V as one of their premier, premier games for tournaments. I think fighting games have got a massive base in the UK. We also have some incredible fighting game players. Anybody that follows Street, Street Fighter V will know of a guy called Infectious. He's my favorite Street Fighter player, I think, in the UK. I think they're probably going to be one of the biggest UK exports in terms of talent in the near future.